Today I'd like to talk about board farms, specifically my experience in creating one and the problems that I've come across along the way, um, where I'd like to go in the future with my board farm and hopefully give you some inspiration to create your own and all of the kind of recipes behind creating your own board farm as well. Hopefully some tips and tricks you'll learn along the way um, and that's about it really. So the opinions here are my own. Um, it's really a beginner level presentation who's for someone who wants to set up your own personal board farm. It's not a detailed lab grid presentation or a detailed lava presentation. There are plenty of those around um, and suggestions and improvements are welcome. Um, I've got a long Q&A section at the end where hopefully you can ask questions. Um, also, my email's on the front page of the slides if you want to get in touch that way. Um, there are links throughout the slides as well. Um, if you download the PDF, you'll be able to click on the link through and see all the information that I've linked to. Um, so firstly, I want to go through the background and the goals for setting up my board farm, some of the decisions that I had to make while I was coming up with it. Um, I'm going to have a little review of some existing board farm solutions and how I set up my home lab, which is cheap um, and fully functional as well. So I'm going to go through the software stack and some of the hardware choices that I've made along the way and then end up with a demo of using it um, and then talk about the future ideas that I've got and things that I might like to do in future with my setup. Um, and then I hopefully take some questions at the end. <clears throat> so I'm Chris. I have got a hardware development background with embedded Linux, IoT, um, bare metal stuff, things like RTOSs, that kind of thing. Um, these days I'm a senior engineer at Collabora, uh, working on a lot of software products. So I think my hardware background makes me see software in a different way. Um, I work in the core team at Collabora where I help customers with system integration, usually around Debian, Apertis, on their custom embedded platforms. All kinds of things like software upgrades, um, packaging, that kind of stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm always keen to learn more and check out new things that are in the um, embedded world. So I've always really been interested in board farms, um, creating sort of setups that make it easier for me to actually um, do my daily work. So these days I'm remote working and a lot of my colleagues are also remote working and it's really hard for us just to get a board to try a patch or something. So it's really important if we can share our boards without having to ship them to each other. Um, also, debugging away from the board is quite important because not everyone can have the board next to you. Um, you're doing a lot of work on multiple boards probably at the same time. It's quite hard to figure out how to actually plug the board in in some cases. You know, it takes a long time to figure out the settings for like serial ports, that kind of thing. It's just time that's just wasted. Um, flashing SD cards is probably the bane of my life. I don't know if that's the same for anyone else. Flashing an SD card and then testing something and then doing it again, it's just wasted time. Um, hardware these days is very limited. Um, hardware is very limited these days, so it's very difficult to get your hands on things, especially if you're in remote countries, like we've got some employees in Brazil and India. It's quite hard to ship boards there, so it's much easier if you can share your board with them. Um, we've also had some instances where customers actually couldn't ship us a board in time. We've had to work remotely on their hardware. So all of this is really designed around making sure that your board farm can fit all of these different types of boards in it. Um, also, it'd be quite nice to do some automated testing on the setup. So you could maybe do nightly integration testing of your um, kernel builds and your images. So it's nice to be able to have automated testing as well as the ability to manually intervene and actually do things that way too. So in May this year, I had a goal to set up my own home lab. Um, I really wanted to start small, simple, and for it to be really cheap as well. Uh, I didn't want to spend loads of money on expensive test equipment or anything like that. The goal was to have around 10 devices in the lab as a maximum um, and make it 
easily accessible for anyone else to be able to create their own home lab without having the same things. I want to be able to add, remove and reconfigure devices really quickly. Um, it's, in some cases, it can take a long time to set up devices for being accessed remotely. Um, I wanted it to be really low power as well, so I didn't want some x86 server or something like that running all the time, taking up all the power. Also, it needed to be quiet and take up a small amount of space, uh, basically for a good wife acceptance factor. So, um, you know, she comes in my office and says, it's, it's messy in here, you need to tidy up. Um, so I, I don't want any more problems there. Um, also, I didn't want to cut any wires, do any soldering or have anything like electrocution risks because not everyone's able to do these kinds of things. So it wants to be really simple for anyone to get, get started. Um, one of the main goals was to, just to be able to share boards with colleagues. I mean, I've got lots of boards, you know, every conference I go to, I get another board um, order all the time from AliExpress. And I want to be able to share them with colleagues and let them actually write their own patches and things for those boards and be able to test it without having to ship the board to them back. It's just too complicated. Um, also, we wanted it to work with non-Linux boards. So there's a number of projects these days that are running embedded RTOSs like Zephyr. It would be really nice if we could have our board farm have those kinds of boards in. Um, and we also wanted to run automated tests on it. We have like nightly GitLab CI builds of images and kernels. We'd like to run that on hardware and report the result almost instantaneously. And amongst all of this, the most important goal was to be able to help others set up their own lab because it's kind of a bit of a black art. Um, it's quite hard to get it set up. So the main goal was to make it easy. And this is what I came up with. Um, so you can see I've got four embedded boards and a Raspberry Pi. Um, basically, the four boards are the devices under test and the Raspberry Pi is sort of the controller. Um, obviously, good luck if you want to get a Raspberry Pi these days, so maybe it, it isn't such a simple setup after all. Um, there's also on there a um, network switch, which are connected to all the devices, and all the devices have console um, over USB serial ports and they're powered using uh, the Sonoff devices at the top, which are Wi-Fi relays. So the most important thing for me, as I said earlier, was to not be able to not have to cut any cords. Um, I wanted to make it simple and easy to be able to swap out a power supply and swap out a board. So it's incredibly simple with this setup to take a board out of the system and put another one in. If something goes wrong, um, you can easily remove it and put something else in because it's quite modular. Um, so here I've only got four boards, but there is, there is additional space here for me to add more if needed. Um, so I wanted to talk about the existing solution that we use at Calabria um, for automated testing Lava. Uh, it's by Linaro and it consists of a web interface and backend in Python. And it's really a scheduler for tests. Um, it schedules the tests in like a batch mode and then runs them on the hardware, reports the results and keeps the logs. Now, because it's a batch system, you don't really have the ability to interactively play with the board. Um, and these tests, they're written in YAML and the execution steps are defined in the YAML file. Um, these YAML files can be in the hundreds of lines, really. So it can be quite difficult to be able to use Lava in this, this way. Uh, also, it needs a database to keep the state and the logs, which in some cases the database can get quite big and probably not really suitable to be run on a Raspberry Pi or something like that at home. Um, so Kernel CI uses Lava. Um, it's got a high buy-in from industry and there's heavy maintenance investment involved in it. Um, there's other projects that use Lava, so Mesa CI, um, and also there's other things in the V4L2 area of the kernel where we're trying to add in support there to do integration testing. Um, we at Collabora have a lab in Cambridge with 45 different devices, uh, which has got a total of about 200, 250 devices spread across those different device types. 
it's always growing as well. I mean, we're adding boards in, in batches of 10 at a time. Um, and anyone at Collabora can submit these test jobs and they can run on real hardware. Um, if you wanna hear about the struggles that the Lava, present, the Lava um, Lab has had recently and how we've got around them, uh, Laura, my colleague, has done a presentation yesterday on that. It's available to view online. And she's also somewhere if you wanna ask her after. Um, is tomorrow, is it? Okay, right. It's tomorrow. <laughs> I thought it was ye yesterday for some reason. So here's a snippet of half of the lava farm. It basically is full of kind of server racks, 19 inch server racks, and each place has got a device inside it. Uh, some slots have got multiple devices in. Um, essentially, I wouldn't get away with having something like that at home. Um, my house is too small and I'd probably end up with a divorce. So it's best to leave that where it is. Um, I don't think that Lava is suitable for a home lab, um, mainly because it's suitable for testing specific parts. So if you have a kernel patch or some bit of user space you want to test, that's where it is really suitable. It's not suitable in my case where I want to be able to access a board remotely and actually run interactive tests on it. Um, it's also only suited really for Linux systems, so you can't really do any testing with embedded boards like uh, things that run in RTOSs. There are some cases with Lava that it's actually really difficult to do basic things like just flashing a full disk image to the SD card or the MMC. Um, you've got to do some workarounds to do that. And mainly the feedback loop for debug and test is much too long because you have to submit your job and then wait for the results. And you know there could be other people who's got more important jobs and it takes a long time for the test to run. So it's, it's just too long in my opinion. And as I've said, it's, it's hard to connect to the board interactively. There is some work there um, with hacking sessions in Lava. And there's also an old project Lava Bow, um, which allows you to do that. But from what I can see, it's not the main goal of Lava to have interactive sessions. And my personal opinion is that it's too complicated to set up and maintain for a home lab. I mean, the last thing I want to be doing is, is maintaining my home lab. I want to be developing things and making sure that the time is used effectively for, for maintaining, the working on actual patches, things like that. Um, I'm not going to go into any of the other solutions. Um, there's a page by Tim on board farms on elinux.org. Um, the long and short of it really is none of them, in my opinion, are suitable for interactive usage. Um, you may be able to prove me wrong there. I think you might. Um, so I keep talking about interactive usage, but what do I mean by that? So I mean actually being able to access the board and control it remotely, so as if you've got remote hands there. So we want to be able to control the power, turn it on and off, and see whether the board's turned on or not. Maybe even do things like get the power levels of the board, you know, how much current it's using, that kind of thing can be useful. Um, we want to be able to flash firmware, and we want to be able to boot into the software. So you may want to boot using something like TFTP, or you might even want to flash the whole EMMC or SD card and boot that way. Um, so when we've got our software booted, we want to be able to get into a shell. And really, we want to abstract all of that away from the user. So what I mean by that is we don't want to be running commands like um, getting a shell up using like Minicom or something like that. Because, I mean, really, you can do that. You can just connect your board up to a machine and run Minicom or something like that to get a shell. But we don't want to remember all the settings. We, we don't want to do anything like that. So we want to abstract all of that away and make it nice and easy for us to connect to the board. We also want to know who's using what and be able to reserve hardware. So you don't want someone interrupting your hardware testing. Um, you don't want the CI system to come in and push a job and you, want it, you don't want it to just interrupt your, your, your session really. So LabGrid is a tool by Pengatronics. Um, there's some people from Pengatronics here today uh, who hopefully will be able to answer any specific questions um, later on. 
Um, it's a CLI tool, so you can interactively communicate with your boards. Uh, there's also a Python library, which allows you to automate, automated, run automated tests um, or more complicated tests. It's really usable for daily interactive development as well as debugging, I think. Um, it's really simple just to be able to get started and it's really good because it abstracts the hardware into functional topics. So you can ask LabGrid to turn a board on, you can ask it to get a console, you can do things like um, upload a file to the board, that kind of thing. So it's, it's written in a way that the topics that you're going to be doing actually make sense. So it would be how I would tell someone to talk to It'd be how I would tell someone to actually interact with the board, like turn it on, flash the SD card, those kinds of um, topics, rather than any complicated words or complicated use, uses. So there's three bits of software in LabGrid. There's a controller which handles the overall system state. Um, you can connect many exporters to the controller, and the exporters run close to the hardware on a, on a machine, and it controls the specific hardware, so that is things like turning the device on, connecting to the shell. Um, and then to the controller, you can connect multiple clients. Um, so for instance, your PC or your CI runner connects to the controller to then talk to the exporters, which then talk to the devices. Um, the controller and the exporter, um, you can put them on the same machine. That's what I've done because my lab's quite simple. Um, a controller, like I say, has multiple exporters that connect to it. And an exporter has places. And a place is a collection of multiple resources. And a resource is just a driver which connects to that specific board. So some examples of resources, you've got a network power port, which is a power port, which implements functions that a power port could have, like switch it on, switch it off, get the state. Um, there's other other resources like a USB serial port, again is a serial port, which it implements a function that lets you get to a console. So it's basically using, uh, using interfaces and abstractions to make it work with any hardware. So one real bonus about LabGrid is it's so simple to configure. So here is one of the places that I've configured in my lab. Um, and it's basically the devices which are on the exporter. And there's a tool called LabGrid Suggest, which you can use, which when you plug in the device, it actually helps you build your exporter YAML file. So here you can see that I've got one device that has got, or one place that's got two resources as part of it. It's got a power port and it's got a USB serial port. And it matches the USB serial port based on UDEV um, paths or UDEV properties, and it's got some other properties there as well, so like the speed that you want to connect to the serial port under. Um, the power port that I've connected is connected over MQTT, and I've defined here the topics as well that are used to turn the thing on, turn the thing off, and see what the state of the, the power port is as well. So then there's also a places.yaml configuration which is for the coordinator um, and this is generated on the client side by the commands that I've put here so you can basically set the tags up and you can add the match to the place as well and it's stored as YAML because it's then easy to um, store under git and then you can diff things and basically see what's changed so it's the YAML configuration is really simple compared to a system like Lava where the, the configuration is, is not so simple, in my opinion. And that is basically it, the configuration that's needed to actually set your, your farm up. It's two YAML files. So then if you want to use LabGrid to connect to your board and you've already set your lab up, it's real simple. You could just install LabGrid from your distros package manager um, you set the crossbar URL, which is basically the, the path to the, the exporter that you want to talk to or the, the coordinator. And then as soon as you've done that, you can 
list the places or you can just run lab with client to do other communication with the the farm so here i'm listing the four places that are in my farm and each place relates to a specific um, board in my farm um, so then if you list the resources you can see the resources for each of those places um, and it consists of the host name of the exporter, it consists of the actual place name as well as the name of the driver that's used. Um, if you add like a verbose parameter, this it, it spits out so much information as well. So you can see what, what is available to you, what can be used. So LabGrid has this feature where you lock a board for your, well, you lock a place, you acquire a place for your usage um, and then when you're finished with it, you release the board and then let other people use the board. There is also um, a way that you can wait for a board to be released to actually then lock it as part of a CI job. But I won't go into that detail here. Uh, I'm just going to go into the interactive use case. So the, the steps really are you acquire the board, then you can do what you like with it. And then when you're finished, you can release it. So. If you've already locked the board, um, here I've, I'm trying to acquire a board that's been locked by someone else. Um, you can kick people who have actually kept the board because if someone's locked a board for too long, then you can kick them off and then acquire it yourself. Um, one thing that would be nice is some sort of timeout feature to automatically kick someone after they've had the board for a day. Um, but. So then after you've acquired the board, you can do things like turn the power on by just saying LabGrid client power on, LabGrid client power off, or you can cycle the power as well. So they're real simple sort of verbs that tell the board, tell the farm what you want to do to the board. You want to power it on, you want to power it off. Um, and then to get a console on the board, you just use the verb console and then you get a serial port. It's that, it's that easy, really. Um, so, I mean, I've only gone into a few of the drivers that are available in LabGrid, but there are plenty. So you can get to a console with SSH, serial ports, USB serials, over a network connection, Telnet, that kind of thing. Um, to communicate with power ports, you can use PDU Daemon, which supports hundreds and hundreds of different types of um, PDUs. You can communicate with PoE ports, turn them on and off. Um, you can use the open task motor, firmware, which basically is for some ESP devices. Um, and then you can create your own boards that have got ESP devices on and be able to turn your own relays on, that kind of thing. Um, it communicates with USB relays. Uh, you can communicate with GPIOs to turn on relays. And also the really nice thing is it, it communicates with SIGROC, which is a library around bench power supplies and other bench tools like that. So you can basically power on and off all of these different libraries just with the one power driver. Uh, you can flash to IMX rock chips. Um, you can flash using fast boot and there's plenty of other things uh, that you can flash to, like you can flash to an SD card using an SD MUX or a USB drive. Um, you can communicate with digital I.O. as well, so you can communicate with GPIOs and relays that do other things, not just power. Maybe you want to toggle GPIOs to set the board into different states. You can do that. Um, also, there are other drivers for things like communicating with webcams, capture, um, audio, HDMI. So basically, there are hundreds of drivers and well, maybe not hundreds, tens of drivers. And they're just implemented as a simple Python class that wraps the, the device you want to communicate with. So in my lab, I wanted to flash the boards, um, but I didn't want to use SD muxes because SD muxes, I don't know if you know them, but you basically plug the SD card in and then the SD mux will either allow you to flash the SD from your PC or it will um, communicate or it will allow the SD card to communicate with the board under test. They're quite expensive and I didn't really want that, want to have that overhead in my lab. Um, you can flash 
over JTAG using things like OpenOCD, um, which is useful for some of the boards like the RTOS boards I was talking about earlier. Um, you can upload using Fastboot, Rockchip bootloaders, uh, like I say, the IMX bootloaders. In my lab currently, uh, the boards are set up to TFTP boot, so they've got a bootloader on them that then just boots using TFTP. Um, I manually copy the files that are built into the NFS drive, um, and I've built some images that just have bootloaders on. Uh, you can click the link there to find those. They're built with DevOS, uh, and they just set the board to go into TFTP boot mode. Um, there is some discussion at the moment about how to get rid of the manual, manu the manual copy of the files, um, because that's the one pain point that I've got at the moment with my setup. Uh, so again, back to the picture of, of my lab. Um, I've got a Raspberry Pi 4 that's running the lab grid coordinator and exporter. Um, I've got a USB hub that's got the UART devices on. Uh, I'm having a number of problems with the USB hub at the moment for that. Um, the devices are on a VLAN, um, basically with um, the... They're running through a USB 3, um, USB 3 Ethernet card, which basically keeps the devices on their own network that's away from the, um, away from the public facing internet. And the power delivery, as I say, is controlled by the four Sonoff sockets at the top. Um, so the software on the Raspberry Pi um, is basically running Raspbian. Um, all I've had to do there is change the host name and run the Ansible playbook. And Ansible playbook sets everything up on the, on the host, um, including all the various daemons, and everything is actually in a, in a container. The one thing that I haven't got in this setup is a way to add your own configuration. Um, but you can use my configuration as a sort of example if you like. Um, so again, the playbooks are on GitHub if you want to take a look. Um, so a lot of people will use a relay board in their lab to control the power on and off. Um, I decided very early on that this was not good because it needs the cables to be cut, and then you can't use the cables or the power, US, the power supplies for other things. Um, so it's kind of like a one-time use, really. It can cause the wiring to be messy. I mean, it's quite a, a difficult topic because I think that the wiring in my lab is quite messy anyway. Um, but it would be messier, I think, if there was a, a relay board in the way. And the main thing, really, with relays that that make them unsuitable, in my opinion, is they're supposed to be switching AC. Um, when you switch DC high currents with them, it can reduce the lifespan of the, the relays. You can end up with welded contacts, that kind of thing. Um, so I just think that, that using the relays just really isn't suitable. So I ended up with these Sonoff Wi-Fi sockets. And basically, it add, it, it plugs into the mains of your house and then the other end you plug into the um, adapter that you've already bought. So you can plug any adapter in, it's, it's really quite simple. You don't need to do any soldering, cutting of wires. There's also a little button on the side of the thing so you can turn it on and off manually. One of the things with these relay boards is you've got no way of um, turning it on and off manually without software in the way. So if you just want to turn a board on or the software's not running, properly as it should, then you know, you're going to have lots of problems and pain trying to turn the thing on and off. Um, they're fairly cheap. I mean, I think I picked mine up for about six or seven US dollars each in a pack of like 10. It's incredible. They seem to be quite reliable. I mean, as with anything from, from the, the East, you've got to make sure that it's been built correctly. So I mean, I opened all of them up and made sure to check that there was no leftover flux on the board or anything like that. Um, I've written some firmware with ESP Home for these boards. So basically they come up as MQTT. Um, they come up as MQTT, so you can easily turn them on and off using MQTT. And also you can update the firmware quite easily over Wi-Fi with them. It supports over the air upgrade. So 
the ESP Home firmware that I've written is, is available for those. Um, also, a side note, I've got Home Assistant running um, at home and you can turn the relays on and off using that quite easily. Um, and also there's a PDU at the bottom that is another Sonoff device which actually supports power measurement that I'm trying to implement at the moment. So I can actually get a, a feel of how much power the whole setup's using. Um, and it's also a kill switch because everything is, is hidden behind, the, behind that one um, PDU. So you can easily turn off the whole setup when I go away. Um, hopefully there's no fires or anything like that. Uh, in terms of the console, I'm just using standard USB to UART adapters, um, cheap clone FTDI adapters. Uh, as I say, they, they can become buggy with the USB hub, so it needs a little bit more investigation from my side. Um, in some cases, the bugs are just, it stops communicating. Um, it can happen after an hour or after two weeks. It just needs a little bit of investigation to find out what it actually is. Uh, I'm also investigating using Silicon Labs adapters, which I think CP2102 or something like that. And they've got additional GPIO pins. So rather than having a separate relay board, I can use the GPIO pins that are on the USB to UART adapter to do various things. So if anyone wants to use my... I don't know who that was. Um, anyway, uh, if anyone wants to use my lab, they can quite easily jump in using an SSH tunnel. Um, lab with client supports that out of the box. The only thing here is the exporters and the devices all need to, well, the exporters need to reach the devices locally and the exporter needs to reach the coordinator. But other than that, as long as you have a uh, SSH tunnel to the coordinator, it's really easy. I mean, I go personally through a VPN um, back to home, but this is the perfect way to let others use the, use the lab. So in terms of using CI, uh, I've got a GitLab runner that runs on the same machine as the exporter um, and a small shell script that basically just mirrors what you would do in interactive mode. So powering on the device, locking the device, copying the, F, copying the files, uh, running the test scripts and the command on the board, and then powers off the device when it's finished and reports back the state. Um, you can also write your own tests for LabGrid with PyTest. I've not done anything with that, so I can't really comment on it. But there are plenty of examples on GitHub. Um, so really, I wanted to talk about the future improvements that I would like to make to LabGrid, um, or the things that, that I see as pain points. So um, as I said before, I'm running Docker containers in my setup. Um, the Docker containers that are available at the moment are just for AMD64. So I've got a branch that I'm working on at the moment that builds the containers for ARM64 that then run on the Raspberry Pi. Um, I'd like to add in ESP Home API support. Uh, at the moment I use MQTT, but it's, it's just a big kind of um, mess in my setup at the moment, I think. Uh, GPO drivers for the USB serial port I talked about. Um, I've got lots of all winner boards and I'd like to be able to flash those using the LabGrid setup. So that should be quite a simple driver to add. Um, and also I'd like to be able to upload files to the exporter using LabGrid client. Uh, as far as I can tell, I mean, there's no ability to do that at the moment. So I have to manually upload the files. That's just a, a small pain point for me. Um, some improvements that I'd like to make to my lab. I'd like to document it. I'd like to tidy things up a little bit. Um, I'd like to add some more boards. Like I say, I've probably got about 30 different sort of boards that I'd like to add. I mean, it would be really nice to get them actually all, all running. Um, the biggest pain point in the setup is the PDU slots. Um, maybe I'd like to create an open hardware PDU. Um, if anyone's in, interested in talking about that after, please see me. Um, it's the, the biggest problem in the setup because if we go back and take a look at my, my setup, it's, it's basically taking up half of the space and it's just a bit of a kind of mess. So that's one thing I'd really like to solve. Um, so if you want to learn more about LabGrid, I've, I've put some links here. Uh, basically, there's a setup video that explains exactly how to set the thing up. Um, I think it's about half an hour. It's a really good little video. I've linked to the documentation and the source code as well. 
Um, I've got some special thanks I'd like to give um, some companies that uh, donated the boards that I've used in my lab. And I'd finally like to thank Jan as well for reviewing my slides at such short notice. It's really appreciated. Um, and with that, I'd like to have any questions. Um, you, can, you can come later. Yes, please. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, I think really it doesn't matter because you can have many different devices, but it's just how many run concurrently with a console. So yeah, I mean, I'm I'm looking really to add in more USB slots, more console slots in future. Yeah, so I mean, the original goal and motivation behind this was to actually just do some research to see if, if that would be the case. Um, so I wanted to set up a, a home lab first and then, based on that, figure out whether it would be useful to set up a larger lab somewhere um, for use of interactive mode. So I, I think that's the next stage, is to set up a bigger farm and see whether it scales. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, can we do something similar like the pin for like exactly. Yeah. So I mean, you can connect up um, GPIOs to the system, and you can put it into a flashing mode, um, and then yeah. So that again comes under the power part. Uh, so I think that comes under a little bit more of the. Um, the, t the testing modes um, of it. So you can set the board up into different modes in like a flashing mode. Um. There's a uh, command just uh, IO set. Um, so it's yeah. similar to power, but it's for IO. Yeah. Okay. I'm a little bit confused between what's the difference between a board and a place. Right, so I think that the reason behind calling it a place, please correct me if I'm wrong, is that you don't specifically have to have a board in that place. You could have a place that allows you to put in different boards into that place. Okay. So, you know, for systems where you can remove the board and put in a different one, for instance. Um, I mean, the, I would personally say board and place could be used interchangeably, but it's a design decision that may be could be discussed later. Uh, the back, please. I've not looked at that personally, but there are options in LabGrid for that, and there's plenty of demos for that on the Pengatronics YouTube site. So. Um, I've, again, I've not looked at that personally, but I'm sure that, that there is options for that. Yes, please. You mentioned before that the network traffic is uh, split into VLANs. I assume one VLAN per, per device. So at the moment, just to make it really simple, I've just got one VLAN for all the devices, so all the devices could talk to each other. Um, but that would be a good next step, to have separate VLANs per device. I'm not sure on that. Um, I'm not sure. No. The answer's no. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, if I could make a comment on labeling. So I found in my own lab that I changed the wires around enough that associate, have, maintaining the, ma the mapping between like the USB ports and the Ethernet ports and stuff. It's just, I, it always gets out of date. So, I 
don't know if labels, for me, labels would be hard to maintain. So thank you very much for coming, um, and thank you very much for listening so patiently. Uh, thanks.